this talk called audio networks and the security implications and you're probably going to well, well, well why do we have security implications with audio networks it's all XLR and, and analog and there are the security issues right well the, apparently the world moved on and um, now it's all audio over IP and especially with uh, commodity hardware so here to talk about audio networks and security implications please welcome with a very warm round of applause PC Wiz. Hi. Hi. Yes, I'm, I'm PC Wiz. Uh, I uh, work for the company that put the sound system in Abacus. If you've heard that, you probably definitely heard that on Friday night if you were here. Um, but this is uh, my own work outside of work. Um, so I've been sort of doing my own research. Um, but I work in that field, and that's why I'm sort of looking at it. Um, so I'm hopefully um, going to introduce you to audio networks, what they are, and um, where they're deployed, and get you a bit interested, and uh, also show you just how soft they are as a target. And then uh, after showing you how soft they are as a target, hopefully uh, people are interested enough to think about it, and maybe when people think about it, we can change it. Um, so, where are audio networks deployed? Well, Abacus, um, but also big uh, broadcast uh, situations. So, think about Olympic Games. You've got lots of stadiums, uh, lots of broadcasters, lots of different people. You've got to uh, provide um, a public address inside the stadium for people watching in the stands, and you've got to provide uh, media streams that uh, all of the various television and radio broadcasters can use to uh, create their coverage. Um, and what tends to happen uh, when you make an audio network is uh, that they extend to places you don't expect them to go to, uh, especially in places like theaters, for example. Um, it's increasingly common now that your bathroom also has an audio feed from the stage, so uh, you don't miss anything when you go to the toilet, which is really convenient, um, but um, now means that you've got audio access inside your bathroom. Um, so uh, that might be a problem, uh, thinking about the things we're going to talk about later. Um, and yeah, any, anybody who's uh, got any experience doing penetration tests will know that bathrooms are quite a good place to uh, have plenty of private time with network equipment. Um, okay. So why are we deploying these networks? Uh, because, uh, well, no one deploys technology just for the sake of it, unless you're at a hacker camp, in which case maybe you do. Um, uh, it's mostly, well, cost. Um, everything in AV is uh, moving in this direction um, for IP-based networking. So you've got Artnet on the lighting side. You've got various different uh, video uh, networking standards and uh, obviously ancillary stuff, uh, so your show control. Everything is going over IP networks nowadays. So you can save a lot of money by building one IP-based infrastructure and dragging one set of cables um, inside your building, um, and that's that's pretty that's pretty nifty, um, yeah. Uh, and if you're thinking about, um, it's got it's. Ooh, I shouldn't touch the microphone. Um, it, it's um, it's also more versatile um, because you can share your audio feeds uh, a lot easier. Uh, with multiple places. So sharing uh, in the Olympics again between the, the um, public address system in the stadium and the multiple broadcasters outside is really easy. Um, you just sort of let them attach to the network and then they can ask for those uh, audio feeds and it doesn't have to go through any special box. The network takes care of, of transporting the audio there. So it solves a lot of problems. It's, it's really nice. And uh, it's also really helps with consistency. I don't need uh, a box of lighting cables, a box of audio cables, and a box of whatever else. Um, I just buy some single-mode fiber and some Cat6 cables and some normal 
or fairly normal switches, and, and everything's good. I can, if, if something breaks, I can just go to the local IT supplier and probably buy a replacement. It's, it's nothing which is uh, special to the AV industry anymore, really, which really uh, improves your business continuity, especially if you're touring and you need replacements for things. Okay, so why am I going to talk about the network and not the hundreds or maybe thousands of insecure Linux devices that are sat on the network? Uh, probably, um, probably because it's more interesting to me uh, and uh, because um, a lot of people will already talk about hacking embedded Linux devices and I could do a separate talk on that, but, uh, but changing the network is going to uh, be a longer term goal because that requires integration between multiple different uh, players in the industry, hardware vendors, software vendors, and of course adoption by, by people. And that's, that, that takes a decade at least, um, even once you've, got, once you've got a standard in place uh, to get that built into hardware, um, or built into software updates, and, and then actually deployed. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, so I thought I would highlight the topic now, and hopefully, um, and hopefully we can start to uh, agitate some change. So now I'm going to get into a section where I'm going to run through some attacks, and we're going to build up, we're going to sort of build up the knowledge we need to understand the system one attack at a time. Um, so I've got three different attacks, um, and what kind of attack objectives might we have? Um, so we can damage people. Uh, obvious way to damage people is play something really, really loud and create hearing loss. Uh, less obvious way is um, just disrupt the system during uh, some kind of emergency announcement and you can create quite a lot of panic and then you're really, <laughs> you're really uh, gonna have problems with panicking people. You get crushed people and that's, that's not great. Um, and um, if you saw on the previous slides, uh, we also deploy audio networks in transport hubs, like train stations and airports. Uh, so there's so definitely places where you want your public address to, uh, to work. Um, you can also damage equipment. You can uh, play square waves out of the speakers and the transducers will pretty quickly burn out if you play them at a sufficient amplitude. Um, so yeah, and then there's also uh, reputational harm, uh, which which could go together with snooping. You've got a big a big star, uh, and um, then you uh, get a recording of a microphone while they're off stage doing something less than ideal or saying something less than ideal, and uh, well, you've just you've just got some blackmail material or uh, created a very uh, sticky uh, situation. And of course, disinformation, if you can control the, system, the uh, audio coming out in especially a broadcast situation, um, then it, it's like in the movies. I mean, you, you, you can do whatever you like. Um, you, you would hope you couldn't, but there's some soft bits on either side where you probably could if you've got time and effort, um, time and motivation. So let's start off with snooping. Right, we've got, a, we've got an analog audio system here. We've got a microphone, uh, a stage box, and, and a mixing console. Pretty, pretty simple. The, uh, <laughs> there's an XLR cable that goes into the stage box, and then there's an XLR snake or maybe an uh, Ethernet cable doing like AES50, which is not IP-based, but but a special thing that also happens to use Ethernet cables uh, into the mixing desk. And it's pretty, pretty hard to intercept that. It's going to be detected very, very easily. Um, because if I unplug the cable, the audio stops. The guy sitting at the front of house is going to notice the audio stopped. Uh, it's, it, it's hard to attack that situation. But let's make this a network. OK, we've got a switch in the middle. Great. Um, well, now, now, I can, now I can plug it and unplug things. Uh, without the, the guy noticing necessarily. Um, that, that's, that's already a start. So how, 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 am, I going to, how am I going to tap this? Um, and for that, we're going to need to explain uh, unicast and multicast, but here's our attacker who is uh, clearly motivated to, uh, to spy on what's, what's coming out of his microphone.
So um, just some quick background, because I also need to explain multicast, because uh, in most network situations, multicast is something you ban, burn with fire, and then uh, pretend doesn't exist. Uh, but in media applications, it's quite necessary, unfortunately. Um, so, so to explain it, this is what unicast looks like. You send uh, the same feed multiple times from your source, which is great if, if you have a handful of devices the need to receive this audio, send unicast feeds. Uh, it, it works. You've got, uh, but what happens with unicast is that you start to consume all of your transmission bandwidth on your source, and then you cause congestion. And uh, especially in audio networks, we don't like congestion because congestion uh, basically increases our latency and increases our jitter and makes our audio networks less stable. And if we're trying to operate in a uh, low latency environment, for example, doing uh, public address on a, on a stage when we need low latency. Uh, somewhere in the sort of under two millisecond range would be nice. Um, so, so we have to send a different, um, different stream for each device. And this, this is also somewhat vulnerable because you can just ARP spoof and then as long as you forward the packets quick enough, um, they, the person on the desk might not notice, um, but, your, but, but you have to be very careful about your, uh, your forwarding because uh, the latency is quite sensitive, so uh, expensive network calls are uh, advisable um, if you're going to ARP spoof and intercept unicast in an audio network. Um, but luckily for attackers, well, we use multicast most of the time, so, uh, so it's actually much simpler. Um, so we've solved, we've, solved our, um, we've solved our problem of the source transmission bandwidth, because the source just sends it into the network, and then it's the network's job, so the switch is in the network, uh, to understand who is part of this multicast group and who wants this uh, network traffic, or in our case, audio. Uh, and the basic way that this works is uh, someone, well, usually the router or a switch, is a querier, and it asks uh, everybody in the network what multicast groups would you like to be part of. And uh, then everybody in the network replies with a list of the multicast groups that they'd like to be part of. Uh, this traverses up the tree of switches, and uh, you basically uh, end up receiving that multicast group. So. All you need to do to uh, snoop on the audio is plug into that switch from earlier, uh, say, uh, look, look, find out which multicast group uh, has the audio you want in it, uh, and uh, join it. And then you can packet capture. And uh, Wireshark has a really handy tool which will take an RTP stream and just turn it into a WAV for you, which is, which is pretty nifty. Um, so that's, that's snooping. It was very easy. Um, yeah. So what else can we do? OK, we can disrupt uh, the network. We can disrupt audio coming out. We can create audio artifacts. We can make, we can make dodgy noises come out of the speakers. We can, we can just make the system not work, um, which, depending on your objectives, could be interesting to you. Uh, so the, the thing to attack here is the clock on the network. Clocking is extremely important on media networks um, because um, to get phase alignment for the 48 kilohertz uh, audio stream, so if you've got 48,000 samples of audio per second, and that's, that's your media clock, then you need uh, an a accuracy for your wall clock uh, within uh, about one, uh, one microsecond. So it's a very, um, very high accuracy clock that you need available in your network. Otherwise, you get phase alignment issues, and then you get uh, uh, various uh, interference patterns, especially in AV setups um, like this. Um, so, so if you even adjust the clock minutely, you're going to cause problems for people. Um, so, how, do, how are clocks distributed? Um, how are clocks distributed on these networks? Well, they use the precise time protocol. It's 
it's in the name really. Um, and what it, what it does is it has a, a leader, uh, which unfortunately in, uh, in IEEE terminology is called a grandmaster, but I will not use that term from here on. Um, and this, and this uh, basically is the best clock in the network, uh, theoretically. Um, and this should, in, in theory, also be uh, backed by uh, GNSS. So it should be a, a satellite-derived clock. Uh, and this is going to also help you um, when you come to stream audio between multiple sites. Because the precise time protocol only works within one LAN. So within one network, within one site. You don't want to run the precise time protocol anywhere else. Um, running the precise time protocol over a, um, over a WAN will not go very well, because it basically calculates lots of delays and sort of makes some assumptions about how Ethernet works. And um, it, it does a lot of clever things uh, and relies on a, a lot of clever assumptions. Um, about how local area networks work, and it doesn't extend so well over over um, over the internet. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where that works. Anyway, so uh, precise time protocol. You've got uh, the, the sort of main leader at the top of your tree, and then you might have uh, boundary clocks or transparent clocks in your network, and those are typically switches, uh, and these. Uh, these um, boundary clocks will basically act as uh, they will listen to the, to the uh, leading clock on one interface and then will lead clocks on the other interfaces, um, which helps take load off your main uh, clock lead. Um, and a transparent clock is really just about providing increased accuracy, uh, which you'll find in newer switches. Um, because it basically measures the time that your packet is inside the switch and then provides that information too, which is quite useful for uh, understanding the, the, the delay and the jitter on your network. Um, yes, I covered all the notes. Yeah, um, yeah. so if you're, if you're on a LAN, it's just PTP. If, you're on, uh, if you've got multiple sites, then because they're both based of a satellite-based clock, they should be uh, coordinated and pretty much aligned so you can have uh, a broadcast coming from South Africa and streaming it somewhere and mixing it in Brazil, and it should work just fine as long as you've got uh, access to uh, satellite time. Uh, but, of course, we can disrupt this clock, and then things will go wrong. Um, so one option we have for disrupting this clock is by rigging elections, uh, because the, uh, lead, uh, the lead clock is elected, naturally, um, based on its characteristics, but not just its characteristics. It's also elected based on two user-controllable uh, priority fields. Um, and um, if you ever touch a media network, uh, you will probably find out very quickly that um, you have to configure these uh, in order for it to work correctly. Um, you'll find a lot of media networks where they basically uh, denial of service themselves because they're not properly configured. And the thing that isn't properly configured is, uh, is the priorities in the, in, the, uh, in the PTP announcements for the, for the election of clocks. But, in reality, if you're, if you're an attacker, you can change all of these fields. And basically, what you want to do is say, I have the lowest priority, which the lowest number of priority gives you the highest score in the election. And um, you can sort of fake your accuracy. And instead of saying you're an eternal oscillator, you, maybe you can say you're an atomic clock or something if you really, really want to be the clock. So if you want to be the clock, it's pretty easy to be the clock. Um, so you, you're the time lord now, uh, great. Um, so if you want to make the clock drift, you can make the clock drift. If you want to um, make the clock jump, you can make the clock jump. You can do whatever you like, and uh, it, it's pretty much as simple as running PTP for Linux on your laptop and have fun with that. Um, there's, 
there's another option, of course. Um, you, can, you can do a denial of service, you can generate some traffic, you, um, but you don't have to generate that much traffic um, because, because all your networks rely on uh, prioritization happening within the switches uh, to achieve uh, different uh, amounts of latency and different uh, traffic classes, basically. Um, so uh, the clock is the most important, and this goes into the expected forwarding class. Uh, the audio is the second most important thing, and this goes into a short forwarding, and everything else is best effort. Uh, and what this relates to is that a switch typically has a couple of queues, like eight or so, and there, there's, there's a, uh, basically a, some, there's basically a load balancing algorithm that, that prioritizes certain queues, like the expected forwarding queue over the assured forwarding queue, and then the assured forwarding queue over the uh, default forwarding queue. And this basically uh, tries to make it under certain conditions that you don't lose your clock packets, and that you don't very often lose your, uh, lose your um, audio packets, and that the jitter applied to them is also lower. So all you actually need to do is send, um, send enough traffic uh, labeled, um, labeled with this field with the correct value, and then you uh, fill up the queue where the PTP should be going. And um, when you filled up that queue, then the PTP will start to deteriorate quite quickly. Um, so you don't need to saturate a lot of the network to cause uh, problems. And if you're just aiming for chaos, then that will give you chaos. Um, OK, now we move on to possibly the most interesting uh, attack uh, types of, um, of this presentation. Um, actually hijacking audio streams. So how can we get the speakers to play our audio, or how can we get the broadcast station to play our audio? Um, so we've got the first option, which is pretty, pretty trivial. Um, all of your audio um, streams will be announced on the network somehow. Um, this example is uh, from a Ravenna implementation, so it's using the session announcement protocol, uh, but uh, but you'll also see uh, Dante using MDNS, but it doesn't, that, that really doesn't matter because the, uh, always inside MDNS or the session announcement protocol, you will find uh, the session description protocol, which is the same in both Dante and uh, the Venna, basically any uh, audio over IP uh, solution. Um, and what, what you find in here is um, basically the, the multicast group where where the audio is being sent to, uh, you find a port number and you find um, some inf information about the time synchronization. Um, you'll notice uh, the media clock direct equals zero line. Um, this is interesting. Um, in in RD, RTP, the real time transport protocol, that you, you, you have a timestamp. And this, um, this should be a timestamp for your media clock. And according to the standard, it should start at a random number. Um, where the idea was to uh, make uh, plain known plain text attacks less possible if you, if you encrypted your, your RTP traffic. Um, but um, in most implementations of audio networks, um, this is zero the random interval is pretty much always zero. Um, so that's, that's just an interesting thing to note. So you, pretty much, you don't need to take account of random intervals in practice. Um, the other information you've got here is basically what type of audio it is. And this is uh, linear PCM 16-bit encoded, two channels at 48 uh, kilohertz. Uh, if you have done any digital techniques, you probably know what uh, pulse uh, what uh, PCM audio is. Um, you basically just measure the amplitude of the signal uh, and you measure it um, into a 16-bit value each time and then you measure it uh, 48,000 times a second and in this stream it's a stereo stream so we have two channels of audio. 
uh, and it also tells us what clock domain we're in, which is quite useful. Um, okay. Um, so what you can do here is you can just make your own announcement, um, and then you can make your own name and um, wait for someone to click on it. That's possibly not so interesting, but it will probably work um, because there's no uh, verification here, so the client will present all of them equally, and um, depending on the implementation of your, of your clients, uh, there, there will be some caching of these messages, and you can probably abuse the caching of these messages to uh, make yourself uh, higher in the list um, and more likely to be clicked on. So that's one way of doing it, which would work when the stream is set up. But how do we do it when the stream is already running? How can we uh, attack um, something that's already running? Um, so we, we've mentioned already um, that we have uh, latency on our network. So it takes, it takes time uh, for, for a packet containing audio data to get from our stage box to our mixing console. And it takes, different amount, it takes a different amount of time each time. Um, the, the variation in this different amount of time is our jitter. So we can't, just, we can't rely on, uh, on our network delivering something in constant time, which means we have to, we have to buffer. When we're receiving, when we're receiving, uh, when we're receiving audio data in our mixing console, we have to buffer it. We have to have a, a buffer to, uh, with a fixed offset uh, in time against, against the clock. Um, we, we need a fixed offset to ensure it's, it's real-time playback, otherwise we'd be speeding up and, and slowing down each, each time packets can arrive. And they can also arrive out of order, so we definitely need to buffer it. Um, so, um, so what we can, what we can do is we can, we can abuse this, this buffer. And this buffer will be biggest in broadcast applications, because in broadcast applications, you've got higher latencies, because you're typically going longer distances over, over wider networks. Um, but you can, if you've got sufficient resources, you can probably also do this um, on, on, a, on, a, on a smaller network. You just need to be very precise about your timing. Uh, and um, just to look at what, what package you're sending here, it's, it's a real time. Uh, transport protocol, there's your timestamp, which is based on your media clock. Um, the sequence number, which is there basically to detect packet loss. And uh, in some applications of RTP, you would send uh, um, basically uh, replies back occasionally telling, telling the sender how much packet loss you've, you've encountered. Uh, but in most applications, um, you, you don't. Um, so, uh, so that's not so important to us. Um, and then your payload basically just contains um, just contains your uh, linear PCM encoded audio. Uh, interesting uh, sort of um, fun fact here is that you can list your contributing sources. Um, so if you've got multiple audio streams being mixed into one audio stream, you can theoretically keep track of them, but I don't think anybody actually does that. Um, yes. So how, how, how can we abuse this buffer? Well, we can basically pay, play uh, pixel flute, uh, but with, with a deadline. So you, you, basically just need, you basically just need your, pa your packet to be the last packet that arrives, uh, because there's no way to verify um, the packets coming in. and you're unlikely to spend the time checking if there's anything in your buffer already, um, because why would you? And even if you did, then it would just change the game round. Um, so we can, uh, we can basically monitor the network and see when our legitimate source is sending packets. Uh, so we sent a packet, and then um, we can offset our clock so that we always send a packet uh, so that it arrives at the destination just after. Uh, just after the legitimate packet arrives, but just before the uh, clock comes along, and then we get played back. And that's, um, that's, that's basically how you do it. Um, 
almost got this working. Um, so I, I hope at some point to have a proof of concept published because it's, it's not, that, uh, not that difficult um, to achieve, especially on higher, higher latency setups. So let's uh, start to summarize this a bit. Um, yeah, so we've seen a couple of ways that you can attack network audio. There's definitely more of them. Um, and um, let's um, basically just compare. Um, yes, OK. So um, why are we in this state is, uh, is interesting. Um, the, the AV industry hasn't quite adapted to the fact they're running networks yet. Um, they're, they're running them. Uh, they don't understand the implications of them yet. Uh, and this, this is a sort of table that, that should help us understand the differences and what they're expecting. Um, so as we mentioned, if you've got an analog system, a cable goes from point A to point B. Um, this is, you know, it helps you with traceability. You just follow the cable. Um, it helps you uh, with controlling ingress and egress because if you unplug the cable, audio stops. Uh, it's very detectable, and it creates um, and it creates a natural choke point of a mixing desk where all of the audio is definitely going through a mixing desk because that's where the cables go. Um, where there's on uh, when you're using audio over IP, the network can basically be routed. The audio can basically be routed in a matrix from any device on the network to any other device on the network. So you've lost that choke point. And the only way to really observe that is to get your NetFlow data from all of your switches, which is not something that audio engineers are equipped to do or particularly want to do. Uh, so we need to find some solutions to that. Um, what can we do in practice today? Well, a lot of these are sort of bad solutions to problems we really shouldn't have. Um, but you can do network monitoring. And if you've got a fixed installation um, with uh, a lot of resources, then you can probably afford to have a security team look at your network occasionally, uh, collecting data and uh, figuring out what normal looks like. Um, you can disable ports, which kind of works. Um, in practice, it's not going to happen because someone's going to plug something in last minute, complain that it doesn't work, then just enable all of the ports again, um, because that's basically the, the practical side of, uh, of AV technology at the moment. Um, you could try to implement 802.1x on all of your devices, which has a bunch of management overhead, and your devices probably don't support it. And you could try to do MAC address filtering, but it, it really wouldn't be that effective. Um, yeah, yeah, it would increase, increase your attack time by 30 seconds or whatever, how, however long it takes you to notice that there's MAC address filtering in place and uh, start spoofing your MAC address. Uh, then your other option is basically just segment your network, make sure that your show control isn't running on the same network as your audio, make sure your lighting isn't running on the same network, and, and, and just try to minimize your, your footprint. So how's it moving in the right direction? Uh, well, PTP is getting better. Uh, the, the, the clock can now be authenticated, um, which is helpful. And the clocks can also be validated against multiple clock domains. So now a uh, PTP uh, client can, um, can listen to multiple PTP clock domains. And then if one of those clock domains is wildly out of sync with the other ones, it can reject it, which is an interesting concept now. So it's kind of a cover them based on, based on what's happening in your network. And there's also the option to do authentication. Uh, which, which I don't think any of the endpoints are really using yet, but um, it's at least a start. Uh, and there's, of course, secure RTP. Uh, the only problem with secure RTP is that it's not really uh, got a solution to multicast yet. It kind of goes, oh, you could use it in multicast, but didn't define any, anything uh, about how you would use it for multicast. Um, so that could be interesting. Uh, so what, what we're missing, basically, is, is a usable way to distribute uh, keys to multicast groups. 
um, and all of the software and hardware implementations that support it. Because when we can distribute key material, then, then we, uh, when we've solved a lot of this problem. That's pretty much everything. Um, yeah, this is my own research, but um, I, my employer is also looking to hire a lot of people. So if you're looking for a job in the, uh, making loud things, then you can, um, you can join Holoplot. We've got lots and lots of jobs, really a lot of them. Um, also, if you just want to move to Berlin, it's quite a nice place to live. Um, yeah, I think we might have some time for questions. Thank you very much for the more than interesting talk. Um, well, if you have questions, please line up at the microphones in the middle of the tent. And while you do that, I have one question. Would be a mitigation to just switch back to XLR? <laughs> that, 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 that is a mitigation, but I think, uh, I think the industry has changed enough that it, it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, I, think, uh, I think one of the World Cups, like, over a decade ago was already using uh, audio for IP. So it's um, definitely in the higher end applications, it's, it's already there and uh, it's not going back. Um, so, so that cat is out of the box. That, 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 that cat is out of the box. Um, the, the only thing we can do now is uh, try to create a secure standard to use um, and try and get it implemented. Questions from the audience? You look like knowledgeable people, and it was a highly technical talk. Any questions? No. Seriously? That's Going once? <laughs> yes, please, Ooh. come up to the mic. So, uh, analogous to the XLR situation, how expensive and practical would it be to just apply only physical security to the whole thing. Well, that, that's an interesting idea. You could apply only physical security to it, um, but then you put a switch and a ceiling tile above your bathroom, and I don't know whether you want to put a CCTV camera in your bathroom. Well, like, so, I mean, like, separating all of these things, because in the XLR situation, yeah. everything was physically separated in any way, so isn't that, like... Well, not the proper solution, but yeah, the yeah. solution? Yeah, I mean, f physical separation is, is a good start, and it's going to minimize, minimize your attacks, but I think in the size of the venues that exist nowadays, there's always an unprotected network access point somewhere. So you, you, you're always going to find something. So there's, there's switches at front of house, there's switches behind stage, there's switches in the foyer uh, outside. It's, there's lots of different places where, unless you've got security walking around the whole time, or CCTV and you know, everything else, you're going to have a hard time um, controlling your network perimeter. Um, you know, it's not to say you shouldn't try to control your network perimeter. You definitely should. But, um, but the network perimeter, I don't think, is going to keep people out. Um, and maybe um, also worth mentioning that in a lot of these situations, you've got contract workers coming in with random laptops um, introducing random machines to networks, um, so you could you could you could come in already with malware on the laptop that wants to exploit this specific thing. And probably, if I may add, um, companies or installations are not are not keen to implement twice the IP cabling uh, for just for audio. Well, well, that's an interesting point. They actually do tend to tend to build two networks. Um, oh. Um, but, but, not, but not, to not to separate the different things. Uh, they, tend to, they tend to build two networks because the way, that, uh, the way that redundancy is done in these networks is you build two completely independent networks, ones on like 192.168.100 slash 24 and ones on uh, 200 slash 24 and, um, and, they, and they operate completely separately and you and then each device has a primary and a secondary interface on it, and you send the same packet over both, um, is, is basically how redundancy works on these networks. So they tend to build two, but they don't tend to build it for network segmentation. They build it for practical uh, redundancy reasons. 
want, want to follow up? Please, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Like, if there's nobody else here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I think the question I would was getting at was, um, did the security actually decrease with the digit? Like, yeah. for, if you would put XLR cables and audio cables through the whole, through mm -hmm. all of your buildings, etc., um, or you would just put these digital tiny cables in there, did the security actually decrease while moving to digital cables? Um, I would say that it did, because they generally added more access points to the, to the, to the network. Um, they generally put it in places it wasn't before. Um, yeah, so, so they generally used the versatility that was added, and by using the versatility that was added, increased their exposure. Um, and also, you've then got computers which, which just come into networks, and you can run a, a virtual sound card on your laptop and then put audio onto the network. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that difficult to do. Um, and again, these laptops come from, you know, private one-man AV contractor turns up to do a gig, uh, poorly uses the laptop for other things, um, and then God knows what's on there. Excellent. All questions answered. Anyone else? We still got some time. Think about it. Now's the time. One going once, going twice. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like to ask you to give another very warm round of applause for this wonderful talk. PC Wiz. Thank you very much.